thank you uh, for the introduction and and thank you obviously to uh, to natasha for for organizing this this wonderful gathering and and to all the helpers um that have made this possible um thank you i think um as much for the for the amazing presentations so far um i i've learned a great deal um and i, and I intend to learn a great a great deal more um over the over the rest of the conference but um what it made me think of and this was just a, a last minute addition um reflecting upon the the experience of yesterday um was um something that i'd been looking at recently so i just i'll drop this in as a complete uh a complete sort of change of pace for a moment. Um, reading Braudel recently again um, and thinking about you know what what events can do for us. Um, thinking about the, the event of Plataea as as one of the ephemera of history, you know, passing across the stage like a firefly. I'm not sure that's quite right for Plataea. I'm not sure it is a firefly, um, but it 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 shows. I, I think the, the the type of papers, the way in which this conference has come together. The, the way in which the the, the sort of the, the fulcrum and the focus of, of the, the, the battle is allowing us to see so many different things at work um, is is very much the Braudelian sense of you know the, the event allowing us to open up wider vistas of history and, and, and it's so unusual that we get the opportunity to do this within Greek history to sort of really focus on something that's rich enough that so many people can come to that and, and then experience this wider this wider benefit. So I'm, 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 I'm very pleased. And I hope that I, I can contribute a little bit to this. Um, I've just learned an, an awful lot again from hands as I, I always do. Um, my paper, as I say, is sort of, um, it, it's, it's off the back of, of this little article that I wrote for, for Hermesina last year, which very much dealt with the local aspects of it, trying to think about the eruption of the Persians into Boeotia, um, um, into this pre-existing set of, um, of priorities and relationships. Um, and perhaps what I didn't do as much as I would have liked to there is to think about the forms of collaboration between Thebes and Persia in the period around the Battle of Plataea. Um, so, so there are some elements within that, within the article, but um, it's much more concerned with those wider landscapes. Um, so I'm just going to focus on a few of the most interesting snapshots from, from my perspective of the relationship between Thebes and Persia, um, taken from Herodotus's photo album, mainly, I think, um, from around the battle and broken into these sort of four, four areas. The building of a relationship between Thermopylae and Plataea, the hospitality of the Thebans, the coordination of fighting around the battle, and then the later resonances of the collaboration in a slightly different way, I think, to, to, to the way in which um, Hans has been thinking about it. Um, for the audience, for this uh, illustrious audience, I, I, I suspect that all the examples um, I'm going to put into the foreground here will be very familiar, um, but perhaps not always from this perspective. The crux is really that Herodotus writes about the Theban Persian relationship to memorialize and to condemn, perhaps, in, in the Theban um, sense. But in doing so, he makes visible a series of remarkable interactions, many of which are coming from Theban sources. Um, and the spillover into modern historiography of, of the Herodotian presentation has been pervasive. I think rarely is Theban collaboration with Persia explicitly condemned um, today, but the pejorative nature of the relationship um, has continued to obscure analysis. I think of what is in many ways a uniquely successful and harmonious period between a major Greek state and Persia. Um, and um, and, and I just get the sense of that from, from the papers that we've had so far to, uh, over the course of the last couple of days. When Thebes comes up, it's with a, you know, with a dark cloud. Um, and and I, I've never really experienced that. I've always, I've always seen this as quite a, quite a positive thing, um, but that might be um, my own um, psychopathology. Um, unlike other mainland Greek communities, the first the Thebans might ever have had to do with the Persians, at least on a state level, was at Thermopylae, meeting across the battlefield, um, the Thebans fighting fairly ferociously, it seems, until the very last minute when they quite sensibly said, um, thank you, we've had enough. Um, do you want to come for tea? 
Um, and the transformation in the relationship between uh, Thermopylae and the Persian arrival in Boeotia um, was attributed to Herodotus to the intercession of the Macedonians and the, 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 the Thessalians and Demaratus of Sparta, um, all working very energetically on the Thebans' behalf. And I think this speaks to um, the fact that this is not a smooth transition. This is not um, a, a given that the Persians would necessarily say, okay, we'll work with the Thebans. Um, indeed, quite the opposite might have been expected, but through this activation of an elite set of uh, relationships, um, the Thebans were able to smooth this very anxious path, this very nervous entrance into Boeotia of the Persians. We can see right from the start that the Persian, uh, the Thebans are tasked with um, overcoming the Persian lack of familiarity with the landscape and acted as guides for Persian activity in Boeotia, in Attica and in the Megarid. Despite participation at Thermopylae, the um, Thebans seem to have escaped any, any retribution of any sort, um, which speaks loudly of, uh, to this political transition. Um, but considering the situation perhaps from a, a Persian perspective, it also speaks to the relative strength of Thebes as a community and the benefits which partnership could bring for both sides. Um, Thebes was strategically well situated in the plains of southern Boeotia, the neighboring communities to the south, whom they usually shared the plains, uh, with had been destroyed by the Persians, and Thebes was also uh, a, a very large, well-fortified, substantial and successful community in its own right. And just a couple of examples that, that came up yesterday that, that seemed apropos here, the, the thousand Phokians can be admitted into the, into the city without any trouble. Um, you know, sure, let's bring in a thousand more people. Never mind that, what about 300,000? Let's bring in the, uh, the entire Persian army with all the, all the baggage, with all the animals. It's uh, you know, uh, the, the suggestion of Artabazus that that's perfectly possible. Let's just go and hold up in Thebes. Um, this is you know, it, it, hyperbole, it, you know, it's, it is exaggeration, but it is, helpful to remember that unusually within Greece, the Cadmea is not just an Acropolis. It's not just a fortified high point within the city. It is the city. It is the main residential area. It's huge. Um, and that's where everything happens. Um, and I think that's really important to understanding the, the kind of interactions that we get every time um, some, some major power turns up in Boeotia, whether it be, whether it be the Persians later the Macedonians and, and others later on. Um, against this background, it should be unsurprising that the Thebans were able to take a creative role um, in Persian decisions and behavior. The Thebans recognized the opportunities presented by the arrival of the Persians. And um, Herodotus at least records that they suggested that the, the Persians could, could base their forces in Boeotia after the attack on Athens later in 480 BC. The plains of southern Boeotia were a good location for a large army to, to base itself and the availability of the land previously home to the Plataeans and Thespians would enhance the advantages of the area as a base of operations. That the Thebans could be presented as offering the Persians this base suggests to me that the Thebans may already have been given control of all of these uh, newly um, vacated lands in southern Boeotia. Xerxes' departure from Greece at the end of 480 BC left Mardonius in charge. And this transition allows, uh, within Herodotus, the nascent relationships between some of the Thebans and the Persian elites to become much more visible. Mardonius chose to base his forces uh, in, Win uh, in Thessaly through the winter of 480 and 479 BC, but he continued to engage with Boeotia whilst wintering there. Herodotus reports he wished to consult oracles everywhere, um, but, um, oh, and, and using the Carian myths um, for this task. But of the five consultations recorded, um, four are in Boeotia, 
and the other is up in Abai, in northeastern focus, just uh, just north of, of Boeotian or Komonos. The information about these consultations comes from Thebans, um, and, and two Theban oracles are consulted, with Thebans acting as guides on at least part of the rest of the tour. And we know from the, 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 um, the, the newly famous Creasus inscription um, that the Thebans were very busy chatting away to Herodotus about all of the, all of the things within the Amphiarian, at least, and presumably elsewhere um, through um, the Theban territories. The importance, again, of Theban assistance and direction is emphasized, as is the sense of continued interaction and facilitation of access throughout the winter despite the Persian primary base being up in Thessaly. From a Persian perspective, um, this may again speak of a wish to keep their uh, Theban partners happy. We're not told directly what the consultations uh, of the oracles concern, um, but the next section, um, so 8136 um, in Herodotus, um, suggests that the, the, the pattern is that the oracles were consulted directly before this renewed attempt at uh, making a deal with Athens. Um, so it, um, I think it's a suggestion I, I, I first saw in a, in a paper by Matthew Sears um, that the, the, the Persians are working very hard to keep the, Pers uh, the Thebans on side by widely consulting Theban oracles before then sort of building some sort of justification for making uh, friends with Athens, which the Thebans might not have been very happy about. Um, after this wintering in Thessaly, itself a strategy which speaks of the trust in the steadfastness of the Thebans of allies as allies in their absence. The Persian army encamped again at Thebes and awaited the arrival of the Spartan-led forces from the Peloponnese. While there, a Theban Atagonus invited Mardonius and 50 of the most notable Persians to be guests at a banquet where each Persian reclined with a Theban in pairs in something ostensibly resembling the arrangement of a typical Greek symposium. Now, I'm not too worried by the fact that, that Hans had such a go at this um, tradition um, before because I'm, I've, I've sort of, I think I'm looking at it in a slightly different way. Um, but if, if we imagine this as, as something real, this sort of interaction on a, on, a, on a grand scale between Thebans and Persians here, you know, more than a hundred diners, you know, the idea that these, there are these big gatherings, um, you know, it looks symposiastic, but, you know, way out of scale compared to the um, domestic Andron. Um, Herodotus provides no detail about any specific location or, or arrangement of such a large group, um, but there's nowhere that could house that on the Cadmea, um, as, as far as we know. Um, so the, the idea of these big gatherings, you know, perhaps there's one big gathering um, being remembered in a, in, a, in a very negative way, but sharing a meal publicly in open spaces on the Cadmea, um, in a, a close equitable relationship between at least part of the Theban elite and some of the Persians with Mardonius. I, I, I don't particularly have a problem with this as a tradition, at least in a, in a general sense. Um, Thersander here is, uh, is, is named as the source from Orchomenos. Um, I think this is, again is, is intended by Herodotus to point towards veracity. This is one of his only six, I think, named sources within the, um, within the entire histories. Um, but um, this also speaks that this was a wider, a wider um, congregation. We have elites from other Boeotian communities here. Here, Thersander from Orkomenos, but let's let's imagine there are there are Haliartians, there are Tanagrans, there are others invited to these shindigs on the Cadmea. Um, and think also again about the Cadmea as a site of habitation here. This is not some lofty peak where these things are happening privately. This is in the centre of the lived city of Thebes. Um, Atagonus's banquet is the only such meeting of Greeks and Persians, um, as far as I'm aware, in Herodotus. I don't think there's anything quite like this elsewhere. Um, his inclusion of the meal in his narrative marks the extent of, um, of the enthusiasm of the, of the Theban relations with elite Persians. The Thebans enjoying the benefits of their union with Persia would also be starkly contrasted with the, sport, the poor Spartan fare that Pausanias, regent of Sparta, has prepared for himself after the battle of Plataea using, um, uh, using uh, Mardonius's stuff. Um, now, 
this is a sort of bit of a light relief perhaps um, from, from the, the main thrust here, but um, we have Athenaeus's later reflection on uh, the hospitality of Atagonus. Uh, this has any basis, then the, the, the Theban banquet might not have been uh, the most enjoyable gestatory affair for the Persians. I mean, it doesn't look too bad to me, but um, Athenaeus seems to have a problem with forced meat boil boils, ribs of beef, soup, um, sausages, um, etc. Um, but we don't need to worry about the culinary tradition here um, to underline that the meal became closely attached to the memory of Thebes as Medizer, an event that is, is, is very able to speak of a deeper intimacy than any other collaborator. Um, for Auditus and later Philhellenic writers, this is contemptible, but I think it's productive to acknowledge the tradition as a, as a really fascinating moment in the relationships between Greeks and Persians at, at any point. Um, moving on to the battle itself, um, Mardonius had chosen Thebes as his base because it offered a good situation for his forces to be supplied from and which to fight an open battle against the Greeks. Cavalry was especially important in the um, calculation, um, but confidence in and reliance on the support of his Theban hosts was another significant factor. And in the early exchanges before the Battle of Plataea, the tradition that um, the Herodotus reports is one where tactics, if not strategy, are clearly coordinated between Thebans and Persians. Thebans as a group are represented advising Mardonius on arrangement of forces against the Greeks. And we have specific commanders, um, Timogenides, um, giving detailed instructions on the routes over Kitheron used um, by the Greeks to arrive in Southern Boeotia from the Megarid. Again, thinking back to Hans' paper, thinking about Theban involvement in this area over into the Megarid, this makes a lot of, a lot of sense. Um, the night attack on Kitheron, more than nine miles from the Cadmea, is unthinkable without knowledgeable Theban guides on horseback operating closely with their Persian allies. Herodotus goes on to emphasize at 940.1 uh, that um, though the Persians and Medes did all the courageous fighting, the Thebans led them until the point of engagement. Um, this is, was read in the commentary, the, the green and yellow commentary by Flower and, and John uh, Marincola as doubly damning, um, as it emphasizes both enthusiastic Medism um, as well as the lack of deeds of bravery um, on, on the part of the Thebans. But if we continue to emphasize the positives of the relationship from a Theban perspective, they are reaping the benefits of their close alliance with the Persians who are taking the lion's share of the risks in actual combat in exchange for local intelligence and the use of Theban territory and its resources. In the preliminaries to the battle, the role of um, Theban forces in actually attacking the allied Greeks is, is not very clear. Um, they're coordinating, but apparently not doing much um, of um, the actual fighting. But in the end stages of the battle, the Thebans are presented engaging with belligerents from neighboring communities, Athens and Megara. 300 of the first and best Thebans were killed by the Athenians, while 600 Megarians and Phlyasians were killed by Theban cavalry, um, perhaps working in tandem with the Persians here to protect the retreating infantry. Um, the, the, recorded by Herodotus, uh, but independently, uh, the deaths on the Megarian side, at least, um, supported by an inscription from Megara. That the Athenians and the Megarians are the two groups with, with which the Thebans come into most intense contact during the battle is particularly significant because these two are the communities with which the Thebans were already contesting influence in and around Kithiron in this period. That these local contests were remembered prominently in the traditions uh, uh, presented by Herodotus is, is not surprising, but might also suggest that specific local enemies are being targeted by the Thebans or, or vice versa. Um, in the immediate aftermath of the battle, the surviving Persian-led forces escape the battlefield with the help of excellent and numerous cavalry of central and northern Greece. Um, this left a large and hostile force of anti-Persian Greeks in position opposite Thebes, um, which had things turned out differently in the battle, might 
well have become the functioning capital of any new Persian administrative territory or satrapy um, created as a result of the victory. This city, which had seen such visible displays of the of the um, the new relationship between Persians and Thebans with the banquet of Atagenus now stood surrounded by the victors and besieged for an extended period of time. Herodotus gives us little detail specifically about these closing stages, but Diodorus describes the lively period between battle and siege end with fierce fighting engaged near the walls of Thebes. He also adds credibly that, that Thebes was the refuge of all the surviving Medizing Greeks that the opposing forces could not break into the Cadmea and had to settle for a few prominent members of the Theban elite to be handed over speaks of the size and the strength of the fortifications and the solidarity of the city and the allied forces gathered within. Um, um, this, this resistance of the Medizers helped to make the Cadmea totemic of a wider anti-Medism. Um, and it's really nice points from yesterday in the discussion, I think um, one of the papers in, in the afternoon, thinking about obviously the, the, the opposition to Athens here and, and the, the sacrifices made by Athens in, in saying, no, we're not going to try and hold out. But also I think the impregnability of Thebes, this demonstration that yes, you can hold Thebes. Thebes is a very difficult place to get into. Um, the, the Greeks give up trying to get into it. So why couldn't you have done that against the Persians? You know, made, made a bit more of a fight of it at least. Um, uh, was, uh, that hadn't occurred to me until, until yesterday. Um, very quickly, because I, I don't want to dwell on this, this is the sort of bit that I'm most um, interested in, but, but perhaps is, is less relevant um, here um, for, for the purposes of, of this gathering. Um, but the collaboration echoed through not just the ways others thought uh, about and presented Thebes, but in the lived experience of, of Theban history. Um, and. Um, the fabric of the city itself becomes part of the discourse about wider relationships with Persia and quickly finds its way into other dialogues, including perhaps the presentation of the unsacked city in Aeschylus's Seven against Thebes. Um, um, a note that Herodotus at 927 um, has um, the Athenians invoke the recovery of the dead Argives um, in, in this war. Um, Xenophon and Plutarch and, and others uh, relish um, opportunities to, to think about this, this positive relationship um, with the Persians uh, at different times. Um, and the destruction of Thebes in 335 um, is, is so bound up, not, not just with the history, but with the literary, uh, literary traditions around the collaboration with Persia, um, that it's, it's very difficult actually to see um, where literature ends and, and where history begins in the presentation of the destruction of Thebes. Um, so to sort of bring this to, to some sort of conclusion, and these, these are, are more sort of um, areas that I would want to talk more about rather than, than sort of um, conclusions. Um, the negative tradition of Thebes being on the wrong side of the conflict, which attended the arrival of Persia in mainland Greece, has impaired appreciation of a remarkable relationship through sensitive diplomacy, Thebans were able not just to excuse their um, resistance at Thermopylae, but create a genuinely cooperative, friendly and mutually beneficial relationship visible across a range of different arenas and modes of, of cooperation. And one that doesn't just express Persian priorities, but, but Theban priorities as well. The Thebans were, of course, not unique among mainland Greek polis in, in working with the Persians, but the cooperation was conspicuous, later notorious by its success, and had a strong effect on creating the conditions for the type of battle that we get at Plataea. And in the battle itself, the Thebans and the Persians worked closely together, a harmony which reflected this careful construction of a, of a harmonious relationship over the previous year. Thank you. So, thank you, Sam. I open the floor for questions. Don't see any hands raised. Uh, yes, Christopher. Uh, just, uh, I mean, it, it comes to my mind I, I, on the matter of Ataginus or, or, or the banquet. Um, I think Tom Harrison somewhere 
remarks, I think in, it's probably in his paper in CQ somewhere about the, the story of the, the, um, the marriage feast um, uh, in Macedonia. He remarks somewhere on the, the seating pattern, you know, yeah. one Persian, one uh, Theban together as, as something I think he sees as, as, as fitting into a, um, into a sort of Persian pattern of holding big banquets mm. with, mm. with carefully defined, de, you know, de defined types of, or um, not defined, um, designed types of seating. I'm not entirely sure whether I buy this, but, but actually the scale of the thing, you're quite right when you actually try and think it's 50 of Persians, 50 of Thebans, and, and how many other people? I mean, if, if you know, there's an Orchomenian there, and, and yeah, well, quite, um, yeah. I mean, Herodotus kind of is only interested in the Persians and Thebans, but, but I mean, this you know, is a very big deal. It, it, it calls to mind things you know, like the Opus Banquet or Pucestas. Exactly. Uh, I mean, and that's that's exactly what led me to that that passage yeah. that Tom discusses because you think yeah. Mac Macedon, you think, and that's yeah. that's a sort of, it's, it's exactly that. But it's, then the Herodotus deliberately presents that great Macedonian banquet in Book Five as one where the Macedonians do the right thing. They, you know, yes. they, they they do in the the, the Persian trends. But um, I mean, there's also you know, it's not just Persians doing certain things. It's kind of it's a three way thing. Or, or <laughs> um, going on here. Um, the kind of uh, prior experience within Balkan Greece for this sort of thing, you know, feeds into the Atagina story. I mean, the more you think about it, the more, I mean, one has to, you know, certainly mute Hans's scepticism about the whole thing. I mean, it, it actually sounds rather plausible. I mean, grosso modo. Mm, well, Hans, what, what, what do you think about the, because I'm, <laughs> I'm interested in, in, in how, how strongly you want to, can, uh, I, can I just come back on this? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, John, jumping the queue here. Um, no, I, I, I guess I didn't, I didn't articulate myself properly when I talked about this. And I thank you, Sam. This, this was fantastic, right? I mean, fa fantastic way of looking at these relations. But as for the banquet, it would be heavy handed to dismiss its historicity. That's not my point. I'm not denying not only the possibility, but probably the factuality of such a gathering. And your talk, Sam, has made this very clear to me. I think the way you take the structural data and say, look, this is among many nights of feasting, there was one that was particularly prominent and that was accordingly used by Herodotus to condense all of this and put it in one banquet description. So, I did not mean to dismiss the banquet as a historical event. What I'm having problems with is interpretations of that banquet as something that, hmm, yeah, that in minute details fleshes out the amicable relations and morally corrupt relations at hindsight between the two participating parties. Um, seeding patterns that comes up with Chris's comment uh, here, um, the thing that, that, that this brings together aristocracies from Boeotia as well as from Persia, not only from Thebes and other places, that makes perfect sense. But at the same time, and I believe it was Tom Harrison as well, at the same time, it is undeniable that the whole thing is really narrativized in a way and charged in a moral way that is really doesn't help. And that is only there to stigmatize the Thebans, I think. So yeah, that's, I, I quite that's agree. my, my I, caution yeah. or my caveat here that I don't want to dismiss the whole thing. I want us to be alert and, and cautious as we read this, especially in conversations about medicine. Absolutely, I, I, I quite agree with with, with that, Hans. Um, but I think you know the, my 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 big point is that I, I think about with the whole paper is that I think that um, that Herodotus, in his in his desperation to present the Thebans in a in a certain way, accidentally makes visible quite a remarkable set of relations. Um, you know, we see this, we see this visibly and whether this feast is a real event or not, there is, you know, there is a, an oral memory of great feasting going on in the Cadmea and why wouldn't there be? 
you know why and and you know i tried in that in the hermathena paper i tried to you know look at look at somebody like pindar um and try and work out what the heck he was doing um during all of this um and what he would have uh, you know whether he was part of this um part of the feasting having a good time on the cadmea um it's impossible to, to to tell exactly where pindar was and what he was doing um at this time but i i, I don't think it's uh, as problematic from a theban perspective as possible uh, as, as as people might think in in the in the post Persian Wars period, I think, you know, they're, they're pretty happy with themselves. I don't see any reason why, other than when we're talking to other people about it, I think they're pretty happy with the way this all went. Um, and they you know, they come out of it as, as good as, well, probably better than anybody else, I would, I would think, um, uh, the, whole, um, the whole situation. So, John, uh, please. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, and, and I love this paper, and, and uh, thank you so much for, for uh, all of the insights. Um, on Theban Persian interaction. Um, I, I think a, a really interesting point of uh, textual comparison and contrast that we might add to the discussion uh, is in Herodotus uh, 7, 119 to 120, uh, which are the famous passages uh, on feasting at uh, the, the cities in, in Thassos's Pariah uh, in Northern Greece, um, as well as Abdera. Uh, and you know, the emphasis there is uh, on deep descriptions of feasting, um, but the Greek hosts are not guests at the feast. Um, mm. In, in mm. those passages, the feasts are presented as the burden uh, on the Greek communities who, who express relief that at least Xerxes didn't also order breakfast um, because you know, how, how, <laughs> how would we get through all of this? Um, so I, I think this, again, it sets up the willing versus unwilling contrast and, and the idea to which the Thebans don't complain about feeding the Persians, the, the Thebans share the couches. Um, they, Absolutely, they, I, that's a brilliant that point. Yeah. This, where the other I'm Greeks are, are forced into it. I'd, I'd thought about the, the general progress of, you know, of the, 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 the Persian royal progress through Northern Greece and the sort of, you know, laying out of, of everything ready for them. But I hadn't thought about that, that, that specific, the, 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 the Thasian um, passages with the feasting, but I think that's absolutely right. And I think this is, as much as anything, Herodotus is including the, the feast um, to, to contrast with the Macedonian, um, with the Ma Macedonian banquet, but also you know, probably these kind of things. He's, he's activating this and saying, look, this is, if you're going to do it, this is how you're going to do it. You're going to do it reluctantly and you're going to do it, you know, in a, in a way that you might even kill you, kill, kill your visitors at some point you don't do this um and um you know but i just it, it's permeates so much of um you know any 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 general work on thebes um that isn't written by you know somebody who's sort of myopically boeotian focused um just is it's permeated with this pejorative presentation of thebes as just they are the worst yet yeah, absolutely we're all agreed that in this period we just got to you know Get rid of them. We, we don't want to deal with the Thebans, um, and so I think that quite a lot is lost, and, and this sort of sensitivity um, that that um, that is possible when you start to to actually think of it as more of a positive thing um, starts to open up other other ways of looking at things. So, Natasha, please. Thank you so much for, and I somehow feel that now we are in a panel discussion, perhaps because I am. Uh, like I, my question is uh, for both of the uh, wonderful speakers, and um, uh, I have it's actually partly a question, partly an observation. And um, at some point, I was looking at um, uh, the use of the word philia or philoi in the uh, relationship between. Um, Xerxes and the Greeks and uh, Herodotus and uh, the, like I'm all very very interested uh, in what the um, Achaemenid uh, people uh, would be able to to say to that. So um, yet uh, in two places in Herodotus, very crucial places, when Xerxes speaks to the Spartans at seven one thirty five and when um, Alexander speaks from the king and Mardonius to the Athenians at 8140. Uh, um, the suggestion is to become philoi of, uh, of the king. So, uh, and I think I see uh, exactly sort of like, you know, if we 
would be reconstructing how the Thebans would feel about their relationship with the Persians, this would be precisely philia. And moreover, I think uh, Herodotus is quite explicit about it because in, uh, at 968, um, he says that the Boeotians are protecting their fleeing philioi. So, uh, so this is, and of course, Mardonius, I mean, it's really interesting how there are switches in the mode of uh, talking because when Mardonius is taunting uh, the Greeks, he's saying, okay, well, they are not like, they're worried about uh, uh, fighting with our douloi. And yet um, there are, you know, like two competing paradigms uh, of describing the relationship. And I think this, uh, like at uh, 968, there is much more sort of uh, pro Theban, sympathetically Theban um, perception. And uh, I think also this quick, quick reference about 300 Thebans who die at Plataea and who are the best of the Thebans is also sort of part of this, you know, grudging appreciation that Herodotus has. So I think my question is also somehow like the question of philia and that's the echaminate question. Uh, does it make sense uh, as the rhetoric used uh, by the Persian side? If you, you mean in, in, in Herodotus, what her, is that your question what Herodotus has to say about this relation? If he puts this in the terms of philia, Uh, I think, you know, like, I think uh, Herodotus is, uh, he, he is not, he is saying that Th Thebans, the Boeotians are protecting the fleeing Philioi. So there is a suggestion that this is Philia. And I think when we see uh, the, per the king proposing friendships to uh, the Athenians and the Spartans who, uh, vehemently refuse. Uh, I think we can assume pretty safely that the Thebans uh, just accept philia. Well, I guess they'd be happy with that situation after Thermopylae, where uh, there's their troops um, reach out to the king and claim that, oh, please, we've been here against our will. And the Persian forces don't buy it and brandmark many of them and um, brandmark them as uh, traitors to their cause. So there is actually an interesting shift happening here between Thermopylae and Plataea in Herodotus's narrative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's not so much a problem for me because I don't believe either of the narratives, but in Herodotus's narrative itself, there is this huge shift in uh, uh, 400 uh, Thebans being actually branded and punished for their presence at uh, Thermopylae, and then they are very close friends at, uh, at Plataea, and the situation changes dramatically after Thermopylae. Christopher? Christopher well, you... uh, I mean, in, in principle, the idea that at least from the perspective of Greek descriptions of, uh, of Achaemenid relationships, um, the Thebans might be categorized globally as, as the king's friends is, 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 I guess, reasonable enough. Um, I mean, we do run up against the difficult difficulty of not really quite knowing how, what, what um, a genuine Persian description of, mm. of that would be um, and, and how it relate to, to the terms of descriptions of, 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 of relations between the king and others that that are attested in old Persian or at least in non-Greek sources. Um, so it's rather hard to know what sort of authenticity um, is, is involved there. Um, I mean, the bottom line is that, that in the end, the king doesn't have equal relationships with anyone, at least not Hue King. Um, and the collectivity of a, of a city um, is a rather different matter from the relationship to a relatively small number of high-ranking members of, of the Persian elite in a court setting. Um, but I dare say the Thebans would like to cl classify it in, in terms of friendship. 
um, in as much as, as that terminology was already in use to describe from a Greek perspective, um, the inner circle, so to speak, of, uh, of the ethnoclast dominant. Um, just, just, just on that, Chris. Just um, in terms of the the way in which the the sort of diachronic progression of the of the narrative goes, um, something that, that that happens is is that once Xerxes leaves, that that's the point at which um, this becomes much more visible. The relationship between the Thebans and the Persians is that uh, is that is that just Herodotus, or is that is that could that be helpful that the king has gone and well, it 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 could be. I mean, we we touch here again on um, as indeed in terms of. Of Ataginus' report of the great feast, um, and and the contrasting analogy with the events at Abdera. I mean, in a way, Mardonius is is as a quasi king mounting a quasi king's dinner, um, not the sort of king's dinner that arises when the king travels through a subject area and the subjects have to feed him, but the sort of king's dinner that the king hosts for the benefit of those who deserve to be in his close commensal vicinity. That's what Mardonius is mounting. Um, and you know, the interest in seating relationships is characteristic of descriptions of the real king's dinner. What was being told about who gets to sit where and whether in fact the king sits somewhere entirely separate from all his guests and so on and so on. So, I mean, what Mardonius is mounting is a, is a particular version of a king's, of king's hospitality being um, being actioned by someone who isn't really a king, but is close enough to a king to have the king's tent. I mean, you do wonder whether they erected the king's tent for the purpose of... You know, I mean, now, you, you might feel if they had, that would surely be part of the story. And, and I yeah, don't know. Yeah. But, but yeah. So yeah, you, I mean, you, see, you see this as Mardonius's banquet, sorry, um, just, just well, the, rather than, yes. the, if, if we're going to see it as a real event at all, it's more likely yes, to have been. Yes, I mean, I, 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 okay, that, that's a fair point. I'm, I'm kind of eliding there. Yes, I mean, it's, it's technically a, a, a Thebans version of um, a royal, of, it, it is royal hospitality, it is hospitality being given to the king. You, you're right, actually, I'm, I'm jumping the gun a bit. But but also, as, as you say, I mean, it's hospitality in which there is an equalization between, the, uh, so to speak, the host and, and, and the guest, not, not the model that you actually get when the actual king mm. comes calling. Um, and, and so that comparison is, I mean, it's good to think with about just where this relationship with Thebes would sit within the normal um, uh, you know, range of possible um, uh, kind of formal representational um, events that, that 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 kind of construct um, a, a power relationship between Persians and others. It's mm. it's a very unusual one, I guess. Um, I mean, the other thing to say about it, just incidentally, but apropos of, of its historicity or not, I mean, I absolutely buy that that the story as told is 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 a literary construction and. Um, not least because um, it, it, it contains within it, in the actual famous conversation, <laughs> and what seems to me to be clearly um, an intertext and one of more than one of several intertexts in Herodotus with the, 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 the Priam Achilles um, meeting at the end of the Iliad. I mean, there is a real Greek literary <laughs> element in, in this story, whatever else is going on, that's for sure. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll yes. shut up. <laughs> one, one sort of negative remark about Thebans and Boeotians and, um, and Persian is that this so close relationship that we're seeing is not reflected on the art of Boeotia. I don't believe I'm asking the panel if we have something, especially Sam and Hans, if we have a reflection of uh, this close relationship into the art, because in Athenian art, we have so many representations of Persians uh, and um, armor and garments as we have seen yesterday. But in um, Boeotian and Theban art, we don't find um, we don't find parallels or influences by Persian art. This is this is something that I think it's rather surprising for this closer relationship. But uh, Yanis, um, yes. question, remark. Um, 
Yes, looking again for that uh, non-existent uh, even narrative in Herodotus, the banquet actually could serve as uh, this role um, because the Thebans are not just making a banquet to the Persians as uh, you know the enemy force. Um, inclining in a couch with a Persian is a very intimate thing, and we're not used to doing it. But you know, reenacting it, it feels awkward to say the least. And you have a, a very close connection, and no doubt in having a hundred uh, participants. Uh, there are going to be intimate things, exchanges between the, the two people in the couch, like the one actually uh, between uh, Thersander and his uh, uh, counterpart, the Persian counterpart. So it, I agree with Natasha that this shows that the, per, the Theban narrative is that these are our friends. They're not our allies and they are not the enemies of Greece. Maybe they are the enemies of um, the Athenians and perhaps the Spartans. But for us, uh, yes, they happen to be here to beat the Athenians to burn Athens and the Retia, whatever. Um, uh, but they are honor honorable people. Uh, and this could be an insight into you know, what the common Theban would think of them. However, the Persians do not think of the, as stated, do not think of the Thebans in the same way. And Mardonius calls them uh, slaves uh, later on. But Mardonius and Artavazos do not have the same views. And Artavazos has the Thebans as his allies when he asks the uh, Mardonius to retreat to Thebes. Uh, he also says the Thebans. Uh, Atavazos and the Thebans insisted that mm. Mardonius retreats to Thebes, but um, Mardonius and Atavazos do not have good relationships at all. So maybe completely different views towards what the Thebans constitute to them, friends or uh, slaves. Yeah, no, I, I, I think there's, there's some, some yeah. good, good points some, there. Uh, Son, um, please. It's like we're getting pretty close to the time, which is good. Um, I want, does it help to think about the events 150 years later when we're trying to understand this? Because, of course, Philip and Alexander make the same kind of argument that we have, we're all Greeks here, we've got to ally against the Persians, they're foreigners, it's Greeks against Persians. And while quite a lot of people in Sparta and Athens are pointing out, you know, those Macedonians are here. They're just trying to make an excuse to lord it over us. And uh, the Persians are pretty far away. And th there's things that they could offer us, like a chance to get out from under the Macedonians. Um, and there we have a, a bit more of a, a balanced source tradition where it's, it's, it's not just uh, so strongly uh, built Hellenic, Panhellenic. Um, well, I, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's very interesting as, as, a, as a parallel, but as, as you know, uh, 335 is, is, well, 338 to 335 really is the occupation of the Cadmea um, down to the destruction of the Cadmea, um, or the destruction of the city of Thebes. But I think also the parallel with 382 to 379 with the Spartan occupation um, as well, the, the, the sort of an ongoing narrative um, with the, the Cadmea um, and the, the, the issue with the Cadmea and with, with all of this is that it is, um, you know, one of the great centers of all of these layers of storytelling and literature and mythology. So every time that somebody does something like this, it activates a whole bunch of other narratives um, on that on that site um, that can people can people respond to, like like Aeschylus, um, like Xenophon, like Plutarch. Um, they can play with these with these um, these embedded memories um um in different ways and and um, it's very difficult with the destruction of thebes in 335 to disentangle um you know the much later source tradition um that we have the inheritances um within arian and, and, and others um who are, are clearly got aeschylus in one hand 
um, and um, the histories of the fourth century and the other, um, and, and trying to sort of, you know, build a, a real picture of what's going on in 335 is actually more difficult than it seems in, in the first place. However, having said that, um, you open another can of worms, the 382 to 379 occupation, um, which is ended by and comes about by and is also ended by internal strife and, and, and stasis and competing factions. And that what Plutarch in Malice, uh, what Plutarch in, in, in the Malice of Herodotus says the same thing about Thermopylae and, and tries to contextualize the whole participation by and explain the whole uh, issue of medism on the grounds of competing parties in Thebes. And there it becomes really wild for us because then those competing parties could be, one of these parties could be behind the big banquet, whereas another party is sitting there and uh, uh, grudging and gnawing their teeth at what happens before their eyes. But we, unfortunately, we don't know, at least I don't know. Well, the, the, well, the incredible thing about, about the end of that, that, that period, the 382 to 379 occupation, is that Xenophon's clearly got um, Herodotus in one hand, looking at yeah. the Macedonian banquet, doing in their Persian people, and thinking about the Thebans doing the same to these occupying Spartans. Um, and, and, and not only that, we have, depending on you know, how we read the, the commanding individuals of the Theban forces during the Persian Wars, we might have the great grandson of Leontiades um, at Thermopylae yeah. as the person who invites the Spartans in yeah. to occupy the Cadmea. And so you've got a whole, you know, exactly 100 years later, you've got the same family doing, <laughs> sort of engaging in very similar kinds of problematic behaviors. So, Paul? Yeah, I'm curious, do any of you see a coercive element in this dinner? I mean, you're forcing these men to sit next to the Persians. At that point, you know, you can't be more in it than to be seen by everyone sitting on a couch with the Persian. And you're also forcing the, the Thebans themselves to witness this whole thing. So I'm wondering if any of you see sort of a coercive element in this, rather than a, hey, we love the Persians. Maybe not everybody who loves the Persians is really involved in this. I mean, I could see you know, Herodotus writing that. Um, that's perfectly, you know, possible. The trembling Thebans, um, you know, sort of lying, uh, you know, in a, in a fearful way next to their Persian hosts. Um, but I just think everything else points towards they're, they're quite happy um, with this. And you know, why not if you're getting a, you know, getting a party out of the whole thing? Um, <laughs> this 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 seems pretty good. And to go back to the to the question earlier about the why 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 is the relationship not seen in art in the same way as as perhaps it is in, in Athens and others? I think this is this is such a brief encounter. This is 16 months, and the, the Thebans have very little to do with the Persians again afterwards. It's not like the Athenians who then go on and, and engage with them a lot. The next time the Thebans engage in a state level with the Persians is towards the end of the Peloponnesian War, and, and they're on the same side um, at, at that point. They're all, yes. pretty much always on the same side as the Persians, um, you know, all, all the way through, and they're both destroyed at the same time um, by the same person. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, harmony um, between the Thebans and the Persians um, throughout this period. And I, I really liked Yanis's question, mm. that, that art question. But in, there is nothing to put on display afterwards. Um, this yes. is problem, it remains problematic. I see Sam's argument, certainly up to 470, 78, whatever. I see the argument up to that point. I'm not entirely sure if I, if I agree with him on how this has been. Um, transported in the after, into aftermath discourses. But on the whole, it's a, com it's a complicated topic and it's nothing to be really proud of, as it were. That's Pindar's statement makes us very clear, as do some other uh, uh, um, odes by Pindar and other sources, actually, beyond Herodotus. So you can't really put this on display and say, oh, remember the good old days when we... Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, that's. I, I, I do wonder whether Pindar had a you know composed a secret ode for Mardonius or two, um, <laughs> you know while while they were there. I found no evidence of these yet. <laughs>